I know I'm not a bit surprised there's so many here um, and we're all here to hear from Stan so um, just to formally introduce her we've asked Stan to say a few words to celebrate our 30 year anniversary and uh, um, obviously we're made up of so many people so many people from all different uh, um, groupings here today in, and uh, Stan has hopefully got good stories that will reflect on kind of all of us and all of what we bring to Focus Ireland and the history of the last 30 years. So, no further ado, over to yeah, Stan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> thanks very much, and thanks very much for coming. Um, yeah, it's great to see so many, but a great mixture of people, of uh, some of our tenants, some of our customers and some of our staff and some of the volunteers and the donors and uh, funders and the supporters. It's great to see the mixture. I said to Lisa Nicole before we started, she said, sure, that's who we are. And that's true. That's who we are. Uh, we are we're a great mixture of people who give and receive. And that makes Focus Ireland different. And just to, I'll say a bit about the beginning and, and then I'll go through a bit of the, of the history and um, I'll have to see which way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say that, that I really didn't set about setting up a big organisation when I started off. In fact, I didn't go about setting up any organisation. I, I came from Kilkenny way back in, in 1983 and I went back to the university as a senior research fellow and I did research on the nature and extent of homelessness amongst women in Dublin. And that research was, was a great surprise, the result was a great surprise to many people because people believed there were no women who were homeless, there were only men. And that was the stereotype uh, of the man who was middle-aged, who drank a lot, who didn't want to work, and uh, who stepped off or was, was in, 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 in a shelter. But the research showed there were 500 women who were homeless in Dublin at the time. And they were very mo mobile, moving in and out. They were young and old. And uh, they, some of them had children, some of them didn't. It was a great mixture. At the end of that year, I decided while I did a lot of interviews with the, the, the women, that I really didn't understand their life well enough to be able to do anything about it. Originally, I went back to the university to do to do a doctorate as a senior research fellow, but when I did the research, I was drawn into the lives of the women. Then I decided I'd spend a year with eight of the younger women that I met uh, in, in the research. And we rented the premises in Eustace Street, 15, the top floor of 15 Eustace Street. That was um, a rundown area. It was going to be a central station, so the CIE had bought up all that area. So after a, bit, a little bit of... Um, begging and anyway anything like that finally allowed me to rent it even though it was very in very bad shape we had no money and uh, i got five thousand pounds from the sisters of charity to pay the rent and i spent the year there with the eight eight young women that i had met they'd all been homeless and they were still homeless they were in and out of homelessness but the idea was to 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 really i, I wanted to hear their story and i wanted to try and understand their life better because i kind of felt if i was to do anything about homelessness i'd really have to understand the lives of the people who experienced it because it was all new to me i i, I didn't have um, any experience of it and um that was an extraordinary year uh, it was a, a really the, i suppose the best year of my life really because I, uh, some of the research assistants that I had during the research remained on with me, two of them. And uh, we spent the year, we didn't live there, but we spent the year really just chatting, hanging out with each other. And we cook a meal and we chair the meal. And, and we talk about life and we talk about their life. And I suppose it was very, very moving, really, to hear their stories. And they told their stories over and over again, in, in one way or the other. And maybe they weren't all their f true stories, their full stories, but they were their stories. They were, it was life as they saw it. 
That was the important thing. And to listen to them talking about the awfulness of their life, to listen to them talking about not having a place they could stay, not having a place they could leave their things, not having a place they could wash, not having an address, not being able to go home to their home even though they had a home, and the awfulness of all that. And they described that very graphically. But I suppose what was even more moving was the way they described the way they were treated by the people they met. And they described how their whole sense of themselves was taken from them by the way people treated them. How their whole sense of dignity, self-respect, self-esteem, self-pride was eroded on a daily basis because of the way people treated them. That people would walk to the other side of the street if they saw them, they would, the people would shun them, people would give out to them, people would uh, ignore them. Uh, in general, they were treated really badly. And they could count on one hand the number of people who treated them well. And it may have only been one person, but they'd remember that person so well. And I suppose that was the thing that struck with me more than anything else. That no matter what I would do or anyone would do with people who were out of home, it would have to be done in a way that would restore their dignity, their pride, their self-esteem, introduce them back into the community and help them to realise that they were part of our society, they were part of, uh, of the community and they didn't need to be excluded. In fact, they had a right to be included in society. And I knew in my heart if I did anything, that's what I'd have to do. So I was more aware of how it should be done than what should be done. Um, and the, what should be done came soon too, because then we started to talk about what is needed in Dublin now? What do we need? And they were so quick to say, look, there's no place that we can go. There's no place we can go and eat and feel safe. There are two dinner centres in Dublin. One is Capuchin in Bow Street and the other one is Merchant's Quay. They're not safe. There's a lot of violence. They're nearly all men. We're afraid to go there. Uh, there is no phone number that we can phone if we're stuck. There's a sim number for the Samaritans, that's for different purposes. There's no place we can get advice and information. And at the time, there wasn't. There was no services, for, literally, for homeless people. It's hard to imagine it now, 30 years later. But there was nothing except the shelters, mostly for men. And, um, and there, was, there, were, there were two for women, one for women and children, and one for, for young women. Uh, but the, and the two centres, the dinner centres. Otherwise, there was nothing. So they said, no place we can go for information and advice. There's no, nothing, nobody on the streets that we can trust. We were, we were fra afraid on the streets. And that really was one of the reasons people didn't know there were women who were homeless, because they were hidden. They were afraid to appear. They were afraid of being exploited. And so they felt there was nobody they could trust. So we talked around those areas. And as the time went by, these were the areas that became clear that was needed in Dublin at the end of that second year. That was 30 years ago, the end of 85, September 85. And we went about, I went about, to do exactly what the women thought was needed. First of all, I, st I, I brought, gathered a group around me who were to become a management group and a fundraising group and who very quickly became, became directors and the board of directors of the company. So because we had to get some kind of funding. And we, and the other thing that I did, I went back to CIE to see could we rent some more part, another part of the building and they agreed to rent another part of the building and we got some volunteers in to try and put shape and the building was in terrible repair so that we could open the ground floor as a place they could go come and eat. We called it the coffee shop because there would be coffee in the morning and in the evening and there would be, they would get a hot meal at lunchtime. And we recruited volunteers, we recruited 80 volunteers uh, to staff the phone, which was a, a, a phone number that people could ring during a 24-hour phone number. And we I got the 
extraordinary, the Department of Labour it was at the time, to, to pay for two staff who could work as outreach workers. And we recruited them and I sent them to London to work because there was no experience of outreach work in Ireland and they went to London to work to, to, for about four months and then they came back to work as outreach workers. And we also set up the Information and Advice Service. We recruited another staff to lead that and the, some of the women who were with me would work on that. So basically what we started at the end of the second year, which was 30 years ago, were the, some of the services that you can see now. There was the information advice service, there was a coffee shop where we cooked a hot meal every day and served it. One of the things I did during the year was some of the, because I were interested in the whole idea of having a coffee shop and a restaurant, I sent um, uh, some of the women out to the restaurants in town, the restaurants that were near us along Nassau Street and Kildare Street and around there. And I, I needn't tell you, none of that was easy because I, they created such a rumpus and such a fuss. I mean, the women and also the people who were running the restaurants, that it was like a nightmare. But they learned something about restaurants during the time. Um, and I got one of the, actually the woman who was in charge of the Kilkenny Design Shop, she, she, where they also ran a very good restaurant. She came in and helped us to design uh, the restaurant. And there was another woman who had worked in India, but her visa ran out, and she came back as a volunteer, and she decided she would work full time with the women. Uh, and she had experience also in, in, in catering. And with the women, we managed to set up the, 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 the coffee shop and, and the kitchen. And we recruited the volunteers for the phone, and so by September, we were ready to go in our own little shaky way. We decided we'd call it Focus Point. It was to be a focal point in Dublin. It was to be a focal point for people in their own lives that would help them to find themselves and that would <coughs> help them to find their way in life and to find their way back into the community. So it became Focus Point. We continued also I continued to keep one of the researchers all the time. So the, con the researcher continued with us and continued to, I suppose, evaluate what we were doing. So there was that inbuilt research into the organization and also monitored the way the services were going. So when we, in the meantime, there was another little project which Sheila Wall had started just around the same time and it was with a group of women who were in hostels and um, she gathered a group of them into a support group and, uh, and their children. And so they ran a creche for the children and they ran a little knitting club with the women. And I'm reminded today when I see the produce at the end, which is the beginning of an enterprise in Focus Island, which is wonderful. But those women started a knitting uh, club and they produced the most beautiful garments that were sold in the Kilkenny Design Shop. Beautiful knitting garments. I found some pictures of them the other day and I sent them down to the office because they're beautiful. But it, it was the beginning of that kind of idea as well that is not just to, to provide shelters for, for homeless people, it is to do much more than that. And that is one of, I suppose, the, 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 the significant marks of Focus Ireland. It never decided we would provide hostels and shelters, and that's the answer. In fact, it decided the very opposite. We will not provide shelters and hostels. What we will do is we will, and we had three things. We said we will try to prevent homelessness, we will try to alleviate it, and we will try to work towards the elimination of homelessness. They were the three things at the time. But basically, we were saying we're going to help people. We're going to try and prevent them getting into it, but we're trying to try to help them to exit it to get out of homelessness. And that was the whole idea behind the services, behind the 24-hour phone service, behind the information advice service, and indeed behind the outreach work on the street. So when we opened the doors, men, women and children came. So it was no longer a service for women. And I think it's a good example, and I always say this, it's a good example that often people don't see the need until they see some way of resolving it. And when I was trying to explain to people, because I went around to all the departments and went around to all the organisations and tried to explain to them what we were trying to do and nobody got it. 
nobody just got it. They say, look, hostels, hostels for homeless people, shelters and hostels. And, but when we opened the door, people got it because they say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They do need information advice. They do need a place that's safe to eat and etc. etc. So I think when you show a way to people, people see a need. And that's been proved over and over again with the work of Focus Ireland. That we often, Focus Ireland is a very innovative organisation, was so from the beginning and still is. And all the new things we start are new innovations. We never decide we will do this because somebody else is doing it. We decide we will innovate, then some other people will take it up. That's the way it goes. But it's that innovative approach to things. Very quickly uh, after we started, uh, it became clear that there were a lot of young people. And the coffee shop, there were men and women, and there were some women with children. <coughs> they were the women from the hostels who would come down from where Sheila had them and other women as well who would come into the coffee shop. And it really didn't work to have young people there as well. So, uh, so one day I fell through a chair through the window and we said, this is the end of this, we can't go on with this. Even though we had very little violence. Very li One of the things I was told in the beginning is you can't have men and women, because all services the, it was, were segre segregated up to that, and still are to a large extent. So you can't, one of the things I was told by all the people around hostels, you can't have men and women, you'll have violence, it'll be terrible. And some part of me knew that you could have men and women. And so once we employed our staff, we employed men and women because we were taking in men and women. And in fact, it was one of the best things we did because there was never much violence, never, ever much violence in the coffee shop. And I think, and in the other services, I think is largely due to the mix of age and mix of, of gender that, that really changes the whole culture of the area. So um, when the, we, I was talking about the young people, so we decided we had to do something about young people because there were a large number of people who were out, they were meeting them on the outreach service and they were coming to the coffee shop. So with that in mind, we said we had to have a centre and then one, the guys on the board talked to somebody else and he found what we have called John's Lane West now, which we call, which the young people call the extension and we bought that. We bought that for £70,000, which was a fantastic price for this big old warehouse. Um, we got it and then we had to do it up and Foss did that with us. And um, it became a big centre for young people. And there were great projects run, run there. There was kind of a drop-in centre and then you could graduate to an educational programme, which was funded from Europe called the Horizon programme. And we trained many young people who, be, who got different skills and went on to do apprenticeships and went on to jobs from it. But that became a very significant service. And that was opened in, in uh, I think, 88. Uh, so that service was started too. The other thing we became aware of really was that while there were houses at the time, there were, there were some houses vacant. For example, in Ballymont, there were flats vacant. So they gave flats, families, uh, they were meant to be for families, they gave them to single people. So there were a number of housing available and some in the private rented sector too. And that's what they did a lot in the information service was helping people to get accommodation and to move on. But the, the um, one of the things that came, came clear to us that, th that there wasn't enough support for people who were in housing, uh, in the sense that many of them had other needs, like mental health needs, and they needed a supportive accommodation. So we opened three little units, three little houses. One was in, in Blessington Street, and one was in Arran Key, and one was in, 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 in North Circular Road, and is still there, 402 North Circular Road. And they were for women and they were simply supportive housing for women. Uh, so that started way back, I think, in, in 88. So in the, very, in the very early years, you'll see there's a kind of a foundation for a lot of the things that have developed in recent times. Uh, they were small, they were tentative, and really we had to work so hard to get funding. Um, but but th th I think what was there really, a, some kind of an understanding that all these kind of things are needed if we are really to help people to move on. So it, it was a far removed from the ideas, oh, that person's homeless and they must go into a shelter or go into a hostel. It was very removed from that. It was thinking much differently. It was thinking of individuals who are part of families, who are part of the community. So as um, that's really the beginning 
And then over the years, of course, the, 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 the whole story of, of, of focus is an amazing story, the way it moved so quickly from, from various things, you know, various, um, it grew, I suppose, it, it grew very much according to the need. Uh, and as need emerged, just in the beginning, as the kind of the women identified what the needs were, so as the organisation went on, new needs were emerging. They were emerging in a different way. They were emerging either because people who were in need, people who were homeless or at risk, were saying this is what's needed, or they were emerging through pieces of research that we were doing. So we were gathering information on the people who were coming to us, but also in a more general way. So very quickly it became clear that other things were needed. And for example, the, the, the one of the services we established, we called it a homemaker service first, and then it became the settlement service. And that was really working with people. We provided houses with them in the community. We got houses for them in the community, in the private rented sector or the local authority. But they just needed help to turn that house into a home. They had, there was literally no furniture. It's hard to imagine how bad things were then, but they were entitled. They were entitled to one chair and one table. And that was it. And we had a big conference about, <laughs> about what was needed. And the, the, some of the customers came along with a table and a chair and set a family around on boxes and were trying to show to the local authorities how bad things were. <laughs> that were. It, was very, it was very funny and very, very graphic. That was, I think, in the, it was in, in, that was 1987. That was the International Year of Homelessness. But it, so it was trying to turn the, the, the house into a home. So we, we had two people we employed who were really, it was the beginning of tenant support, really. But we called it homemakers and then it was the settlement service. Um, and then we moved more into housing and we got the convent in Stanhope Street. That's where I lived in, 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 in Stanhope Street, in the big convent there. And because we, the services that the, the sisters were running there were finished, uh, we decided that, that we would move out to a smaller house. And I asked for the convent. I asked the order for the convent. I didn't think remotely I'd get it. And then when they, <laughs> when they gave it, I nearly had a heart attack. I said, no money, no money, no nothing. And all I could imagine was squatters in it. And it should be squatters. And what would I do with all these squatters? Um, <laughs> Anyway, I went round to the various departments again looking for money and it was like a nightmare because nobody would say oh, it's all sheltered, you want a hostel, you want I said no, 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 no. We want apartments, proper good quality apartments and uh, where people will get support. But it was very difficult to get it across. But finally, finally, Pawlik Flynn was Minister for the Environment. And I don't know, was he just fed up on me? Or <laughs> Or did he have a moment of enlightenment? <laughs> but at the budget, in the budget day, in, I think it was 87, he agreed to give a million pounds. And it was announced in the budget that they were giving in the budget. On the, on the radio, the news of the budget was they were giving a million pounds focus point. Anyway, we got, him, we got a million pounds, so we set about turning it in <coughs> to, to supportive housing. And actually, we did it, and it's a long story, but it was done, it cost, 1.25 million, that's what it cost to do it, to convert it into 80 apartments for single people and 10 houses for families. And if we didn't have to pay the VAT, which was a quarter of a million, we would have paid for it all, but we had to pay that, so we had to raise the rest of the money. Anyway, that was a big project. And at that stage, because um, the Focus Point board had so much on its plate with Focus Point expanding and every time they came to a board meeting, the poor board, there was a new idea. And, and so when it came to housing, they decided, look, we can't really take on this big project. So the idea was that we set up a separate association. So the housing association was established, which it became a company then. And that became responsible for the development of housing and the development of, of Stand Up Green. And as Stand Up Green uh, developed, I suppose, it became very clear that this way of working works. You know, there's a need for supportive housing. There's a need for support uh, for people like this. Now, I th you know, there's a big discussion about decongregating and all that. But at that time, you have no idea how different this approach was from the idea of putting people into shelters. It was, it was totally different. 
and the Department of Environment were really proud of it. They called it the flagship. It was the first supportive housing in Ireland for people who were out of home, the first. So it became a model. And then now, you know, other people uh, uh, have it and it has uh, grown and developed. But it was, um, it, it was a great project. And soon afterwards, and even though this isn't chronological, soon afterwards, George's Hill became so many years later, but the same idea was that the sisters gave the, the convent and it was converted into housing for different people. One of the big areas of housing that we, we were concerned about was not just for single people supportive housing, but also <coughs> for um, people in transition. The, the 10 houses in Stanham Street provided a wonderful program for helping young families to make a transition into the community and provided a wonderful education programme uh, for over many years and families moved out and there was an agreement for the local authorities that they'd house them. S similar thing happened here. So it was, we were very, it wasn't just long term housing, it was also transitional housing. Again it was I suppose identifying the need and responding to the needs <coughs> as they emerged through the, through particularly to our customers. Um, so many things have happened, in, it, it is very the other, yeah, okay, w let me say that in, in um, Off the Streets was the other thing that was established in, 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 in 93. That's called um, Granger's Lodge now um, in Stanhope Street. And that emerged really, again, because we recognised the needs of young people who were out. And there was no place for them to go. And that became a real difficult thing to convince, it was the health board then, prior to the HSE. It was impossible. I used to go up to meetings with them and nobody listened. Nobody listened. Finally, finally, and this was a way of working, I got uh, the religious order, my own, to give the money to fund the project for a year. To give the house first, to give what we call Granger's Lodge now. And then to give funding to run it for a year. And I went back to the department and I said, if we fund it for a year and we show I didn't say a success. We show it's not a failure. Will you, f <laughs> <laughs> will you, f will you fund it then? Then, and they agreed, and that's how the funding came. So the first year was funding through focus, through funding we got, and then they took it out. So that was a very important project because there we were taking. Originally, it was taking young people literally off the streets for a few mm -hmm. nights, and then trying to get them placed elsewhere. It's just changed since, but it, again, it was a, a, a great innovation. The other thing then, <coughs> around that 1993, I stepped aside from being in charge of Focus uh, Point and we got money from Europe to establish a national technical unit and I took charge of that. And that was to a, a research and development unit, a national research and development unit. And the idea behind that was to really do some national research, but also to look at needs in the, bro in the national area. So that, that really, under that umbrella, the research on young people leaving care was started. Uh, in that we were really conscious that a large number of the people who were coming to us, the young people and indeed older people, had been in care. So we did a, a national study on young people leaving care and followed it up three years later to see where the young people had gone. So that research was done and the, the second part of it was finished in the year 2000 which showed very clearly that young people leaving care had particular problems in adjusting to society. 30% of them had been in prison, th another 30% of them had been homeless. So that research became very important and very important for Folks Ireland because it put Folks Ireland very firmly in the map in terms of their broader concern again, not just for the people who are immediately homeless, but really what's causing this. And the second thing that the, the national program did was to go around to areas and to see what the needs were. And we went, we went to three areas. We went to Sligo, we went to Limerick, and we went to, we went to Waterford. And again, it was doing little pieces of research in each of them. Uh, um, it was doing a scoping exercise, really, to see what was needed. And they all responded wonderfully well, except you will know, because it's much later, the development's heart started, except for Limerick, it takes a long time to develop I I outside of Dublin, if you're Dublin-based. Um, but, but quickly enough, we did see uh, developments in the sense that um, we had uh, very quickly, the, the Limerick 
um, development happened. And there we got, um, the local authority were really keen to get Focus Ireland into it. And um, they, there was a development that was halfway nearly finished, but the developer couldn't continue it. And so they decided to take it over and drawing down the grants. And the, the, the first project in, in Limnix started, where there was accommodation for 15 people. And, and, and that was very central, it was right beside the railway station and became the beginning of the Limerick project. Sligo was slower in, in the sense that uh, there was a big interest by the local authorities, but there were many queries by the local communities about having an organisation working with, with the homeless. Uh, Waterford was, was wonderful in the sense that local authorities were totally committed. They were, gave a wonderful greenfield site, which we, we were able to develop um, a big project there um, with not trying to convert an old building, but building from, from, from uh, on a greenfield site. So it was a great project. So it was in that kind of way the organisation grew. Then in 1995, because we had Focus Point working away and developing in Dublin, and we had Focus Ireland and doing this research and uh, I suppose sending feelers out to the different areas. Um, and then we had Focus Housing. It was decided that they'd all be amalgamated into one and that there would be one organisation called Focus Ireland and she would have chief executive and, and, and uh, directors and, and uh, managers and it would take responsibility for the whole organisation. Now, that wasn't easy, I'll tell you. you talk about institutionalisation, but you only have to set up an organisation for two years and they're institutionalised. Because <laughs> none, none of them wanted to work with each other. Anyway. And it, it, it happened, it happened, and it worked really well, it worked really well. So the amalgamation uh, took place and it became one organisation. That really helped to streamline the organisation in, in a way that w maybe wasn't possible before. But in another way, I have to say, if it didn't develop the way it did, it wouldn't have developed that way, you know, because it was possible for the national unit to kind of go around the country and develop that way. And, and Focus Housing was able to develop new projects, um, and I haven't mentioned them all at all, but, but um, it was able to develop because it wasn't encumbered by the services, and the services were able to grow themselves. So that's kind of the story of, of how different things grew. Um, let me see where I am in this now. Yeah, yeah probably, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if we look at um, the organisation now, and the organisation is amazing. Um, and what has happened um, over the years, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary story. And some things have remained the same and many things have changed. And I haven't given you the picture of what it's like today, but it, 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 I think you know more about that now than I do. But some things that haven't changed, one of the things that hasn't changed in the organisation, and that is the values. I said in the beginning, the women said that the hardest thing was how the people treated them and their, how their whole sense of themselves were taken from them. And that I really believed, no matter what was done, I would have to, in some way, to restore their self-esteem, their sense of themselves. And they became the values of the organisation. So when we set up the organisation, we had a clear vision. The vision was everybody has a right to a place called home. That is still the vision of the organisation, because we really believe that. And then we set up, we listed the values, and they were things like respect and dignity and empowerment and transparency and integration, those kind of values. And they became very important. They became the way we worked. Um, Richard Titmus, who is a great authority on social policy, he, he, uh, he he's since died, he, he was in the London School of Economics. One of the things he said was the way health and social services are organised and developed is more important than what they do, the way they do it. And that is true. And that, that, and that is, I suppose, what we try to instil and focus on with the values. And that is, I believe, is true. That the organisation has a way of working and there are values that are sacred to the organisation. And I can see it myself in the little pieces I see when I, if I go around, that there is that whole respect for people, that whole sense of the dignity of everyone, the uniqueness of everyone. There's a whole sense of the 
recognising individuals as full members of society, full members of the community, and have rights and entitlements, like we all have. So that's a wonderful, so I could describe the organisation to you in terms of uh, like a building that has have foundation and has the, it, its walls and its structure and its roof and, uh, and its windows and all that. And it is, the organisation has all those things in terms of its, its staffing, its volunteers and, and, uh, and its services and its foundation. But, but the important thing in it is the soft th putty that keeps the building together. And the soft putty of the organisation, I believe, are the values. And I believe that they have remained the same. And that's really what I hope, that no matter what way the organisation goes, if it can retain those values, then it's sound and, and it will be fine. The importance of home, of course, the home being the central thing, the home and the, the vision that everybody has a right to a place called home. And you, these are uh, some quotations that are here. Your home is everything. It's your stability and the stability for the kids. It means you don't have to keep changing school. It means you don't, you're not facing the possibility of being put on the street the next day. It means that you can do your own thing. It means you can live normally. You can't live normally if you don't have your own home. And that's absolutely true. I suppose the home for all of us, the deepest desire in all of us is to have a place called home. But it's the thing we think least about, because most of us have one. But that is our deepest desire. So therefore having the home is, is, is central to the organisation. The continued commitment to volunteers. I told you in the beginning we recruited all those volunteers for the phone, and the volunteers have continued to be a very important part of the organisation. And I want to thank you, the volunteers who are here, for what really you've done over the years and what you continue to do. The volunteers were sent in the beginning, people out of home, there was the women, and the, the customers who came to us, and the volunteers, they formed the organisation. So volunteers will always be important. At one stage in the organisation, volunteers weren't so important, but they are now really very important again. Very important. And here you see the volunteers, I think they're in the shop, in, in Malahide, happy campers. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it, the, the volunteers are central to the organisation. Uh, the other area that I, mean, I mentioned it also is advocating for the rights of those who are homeless. As I said to you in the beginning, we started with research and we published that research and we continue to have a researcher in-house and that has grown and developed and we now have the advocacy uh, team where we have the research and we have the policy and we have the communication part. It's big now but was always core and it is really so important. I suppose we believe really that um, if we were going to do something about anything, it was not enough just to provide a service. You really had to look at why, what was the cause of the problem? What caused it? And therefore you had to look at it in the broader sense and you had to look at it in terms of research and in terms of policy. And so research and advocacy became very important and today it is still very important. As you know, it's very central to the organisation, it's core to the organisation, but it isn't just research that like universities would do, it's research that's based on our work, that's based on the issue that we're concerned about, that's based on the fact that people are without homes, are at the risk of homelessness and they, well, we want to help them to get out of it. Uh, innovation, I said this, um, here's our two great uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, Liz and Alison, um, and you'll see samples of their work. Um, innovation has been at the heart of the organisation from the beginning it's a, and it continues to be at the heart. And this is a wonderful in innovation because it's entering into a new area. As I said at the beginning, we had the little knitting thing, which produced <coughs> garments, and it is in, in, in line with that. But innovation has been key. Many, there have been so many innovations, I really couldn't even start to talk about them. But even if we think of two, that it's, apart from this one, which is really important, if we look at the work that we've done with families, in, in, in this over the past two years, that's the National, House, uh, National Family Programme, where we're helping families who literally have been left there. Most of them had been evicted by the local authority, forgotten about, years homeless. And people, all, the only question people asked was, uh, where do we put these homeless people? Whereas Focus Ireland came and it looked at them quite differently, 136 families, and said, look, 
how are we going to help these people to get out of homes? <coughs> and we started this National Family Programme. So it was a, a, sh a paradigm shift, really, from thinking this is the way, this is the state they're in, to thinking this should only be a state, a stage. Homelessness shouldn't define anyone. So we set about a pilot scheme to help 136 families to move out of homelessness. And that's what the National Family Team did. And within two years, they'd housed all of them, except 10, I think. And <coughs> all of them are in housing, and very few people now of, of them need support. That was a huge innovation. That was a huge paradigm shift in terms of looking for the need is. Second big innovation is the Housing First project, where again, looking at people who were entrenched rough sleepers. And this was piloted in New York and in, in other parts of the States, but where they decided that they don't put them through the hoops to get a house. You give them a house first, and you put the supports around them, and you help them to make that house their home. Totally different. Traditionally, you get the poor divils on the street to get rid of the drink, get rid of the drugs, uh, get rid of all these things that they're caught into, and then you will might get a house. You might merit it. Of course, and they, they were got because they didn't, uh, I suppose, cooperate with the people who were offering them things. They were regarded as, as people who don't want help, who want to remain the way they are. But they did because they weren't offered what they were looking for. So they didn't want to go to a, a hostel, they didn't want to go to a shelter. But when they were asked, what do you want? They said, we want a house. And when they got the house, and they're responding to it wonderfully. I was talking to Adrian the day before yesterday, and he told me they'd hoped to have 40 people in houses by the end of next week or the week after, which is absolutely fantastic. Again, a total <coughs> shift. And that's, that's what really <coughs> makes Focus Ireland different. Really listening to what people out of home are saying. And of course, what has, what has really changed is the scale. It's absolutely amazing to see that we were in, in, in Leinster first, then we moved to, Men's, to, to Munster, then to Connacht, and now to, to the... It's not Ulster, it's Ulster, of course. It's it's okay. <laughs> yes, Kevin among here. Which is absolutely great in terms of... Um, it, it is a planned thing, you know, it isn't just... Um, uh, it didn't just happen. It's a lot, a lot of work goes in to moving into new areas. A lot of thought has to go into it. And again, it has to be thought about in the way that I have, we've thought about things from the very beginning. So it's great credit to all of you, really. Prevention, prevention is, is, is so important. And this is something Focus Ireland has, has, has really <coughs> thought, uh, thought a lot about and embarked on in our strategy that we're, uh, we're involved in now. And it's really trying to prevent people from becoming homeless. Uh, and of course, if we can do that, you're preventing huge tragedies in their lives and you're preventing a whole lot of trauma in their lives. But you're also making, uh, I suppose, society a better place. So the work that we're doing, I suppose, in helping people leaving care, for example, I would consider that preventative. Because if you're helping people when they leave care, you're preventing them from getting into homelessness and going down the slippery slope of homelessness and poverty. If you're helping people who are in prison, the in-prison service, again, you're helping people, again, to find their way in society so that they don't become homeless. And the increase in the advice and information services around the country, that's a major step forward in terms, again, <coughs> of offering people advice and information, supporting them, and helping them on their journey so they don't end up homeless. And because we know if they do, it is so hard for people <coughs> to get out of it. New homeless, that's one of the, uh, I suppose, the hardest things is to see the increase in homelessness and to see the increase in families becoming homeless. Um, <coughs> uh, when I said in the beginning, I didn't come to set up a big organisation. I thought it, this was a little problem that could be solved within four or five years. I did genuinely thought that. I thought it would all be over. That's the way it seemed then. And now, after, indeed, after all the services have been provided and all the work that's been done in terms of housing, we still have new people becoming homeless. And one of the big things that has happened in, in recent years and in, in this time is the families who are finding themselves <coughs> uh, homeless and who are 
ending uh, for the economic reason, for a totally different reason, because they can't afford to pay the rent and because the government uh, are doing nothing about the fact that the rents are, are rising and rising and they're not paying the, an allowance, <coughs> rent allowance to keep pace with the market rent. And so more and more families are becoming homeless. In the month of March, we had 66 families who became homeless. And they end up in all kinds of um, unsuitable accommodation, whether it is a and b or whether it is, it, is, it is a hotel room. And it's causing huge distress for the families and huge drama for the families and, and for the children. And of course, in the, into the future with a huge effect. So, and we are working uh, really very hard to do something about that and working really very hard to highlight it because we are not going to sort it. That has to be sorted at government level. So the, what the advocacy are doing all the time is drawing attention to this fact. Fundraising, of course, fundraising was always part of the organisation. I said that in the beginning because you have always had to raise funds. There was never enough funds but I, never enough funds to do the amount that was needed. And then in very recent times, I suppose we looked at fundraising, I suppose in a strategic <coughs> way, and looked at it in terms of our total budget. And really, I suppose, looked at it in terms of how are we going to uh, continue to be innovative? Uh, and how are we going to continue to have our voice unless we raise the fundraising, unless we have enough funds ourselves to give us a degree of independence. And, and that's really very important. Uh, and for that reason, there's been a huge effort to raise more funds in Focus Ireland. And, uh, and was in, with great success. And Lisa Nicole is in for the past three years with her team and doing huge work to try and get funds to Focus Ireland, but also to try and put it in the context of uh, the whole organisation and I suppose I I in, the in, in terms of the service we provide and the new needs that are emerging. So it's a very important part of our organisation. It's also very interesting that what is happening now in fundraising is really innovative. I mean the whole the, sh the shine, the light uh, night is new and fresh and is attracting new people into it. But all the time I know that the fundraising team are thinking up new ideas, talking to various people, linking in with the corporate sector, and I know some of you are here today, and it's great to have you. But that kind of uh, joined up thinking is very important because the whole idea of trying to provide for homeless people is part of the responsibility of, whole, of the whole society, but it's up to us to make those links for people, and that's happening through the, through the volunteers. And so it's, it's, it's 30 years of changing lives, 30 years of, of making voices heard, and, and 30 years to end homelessness. That has been, uh, that has been the story. There's a, there was a book that was written by a guy for, from where, where I'm from uh, called Fehe Blinik Foss. We had it at school. I'm sure you didn't have it at school. You're too young. <coughs> but it was 20 years of growing in the Blasket Islands. Fehe Blinik Foss. But there, there, at home they used to say, Fehe Blinik Foss, Fehe Blinik Fehnart. It meant 20 years of growing, 20 years in flower, and 20 years in strength. I think we could count the tens, 10 years growing for Oaks Island, 10 years blossoming, and 10 years in strength. And that's great. And thank you all. <laughs>